The German mathematician Georg Cantor created the first of the monsters in 1883. He just took a straight line and he said, I'm going to break this line into thirds and the middle third I'm going to erase. So you're left with two lines at each end. And now I'm going to take those two lines, take out the middle third, and we'll do it again. So he does that over and over again. Most people would think, well, if I've thrown everything away, eventually there's nothing left. Not the case. There's not just one point left. There's not just two points left. There's infinitely many points left. As you zoom in on the Cantor set, the pattern stays the same. Mandelbrot said that many forms in nature can be described mathematically as fractals, a word he invented to define shapes that look jagged and broken. He said that you can create a fractal by taking a smooth looking shape and breaking it into pieces over and over again. Carpenter decided he'd try doing that on his computer. Within three days, I was producing pictures of mountains on my computer at work. The method is, is dead simple. You start with a landscape made out of very rough triangles, big ones. And then for each triangle, break it into, into four triangles. And then do that again, then again and again and again and again. Endless repetition. What mathematicians call iteration. It's one of the keys to fractal geometry. The pictures were stunning. They were just totally stunning. No one has ever seen anything like this. And I just opened a whole new door to the new world of making pictures. And it got the computer uh, graphics community excited about fractals because suddenly they were easy to do. And so people started doing them all over the place. Carpenter soon left Boeing to join Lucasfilm, where instead of making mountains, he created a whole new planet for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. It was the first ever completely computer-generated sequence in a feature film. Fascinating. Made possible by the new mathematics of fractal geometry. The whole of science, the whole of mathematics, the smoothness was everything. What I did was to open up roughness for investigation. Classical mathematics is really only well suited to study the world that we've created, the things we've built using that classical mathematics. The patterns in nature, the things that were already there before we came onto the planet, the trees, the plants, the clouds, the weather systems, those were outside of mathematics until the 1970s, when Benoit Mandelbrot introduced his new geometry. Mandelbrot came along and said, hey guys, all you need to do is look at these patterns of nature in the right way, and you can apply mathematics. There is an order beneath the seeming chaos. You can write down formulas that describe clouds and flowers and plants. It's just that they're different kinds of formulas, and they give you a different kind of geometry. Mathematicians call self-similarity. The main idea is always, as you zoom in and zoom out, the objects look the same. If you look at something at this scale, and then you pick a small piece of it and you zoom in, it looks very much the same. The whole of the fractal looks just like a part, which looks just like the next smaller part. The similarity of the pattern just keeps on going. One of the most familiar examples of self-similarity is a tree. If we look at each of the nodes, the branching nodes of this tree, what you'll actually see is that the pattern of branching is very similar throughout the tree. As we go from the base of the tree to higher up, 
you'll see we'll have mother branches and branching then into daughter branches. If we take this one branch and node and then go up to a higher branch or node, what we'll actually find is again that the pattern of branching is similar. Again, this pattern of branching is repeated throughout the tree all the way ultimately out to the tips where the leaves are. You see self-similarity in everything, from a stalk of broccoli, to the surface of the moon, to the arteries that transport blood through our bodies. Circulatory systems and respiratory systems and renal systems and neural systems. It was obvious that fractals were staring us in the face. If all these biological networks are fractal, it means they obey some simple mathematical rules which can lead to new insights into how they work. If you think about it for a minute, it would be incredibly inefficient to have a set of blueprints for every single stage of increasing size. But if you have a fractal code, a code that says when to branch as you get bigger and bigger, then uh, a very simple genetic code can produce what looks like a complicated organism. scientists believe that the wildness of nature could not be defined by mathematics. But fractal geometry is leading to a whole new understanding, revealing an underlying order governed by simple mathematical rules. What's absolutely amazing is that you can translate what you see in the natural world in the language of mathematics. And I can't think of anything more beautiful than that. Math is our one and only strategy for understanding the complexity of nature. Now, fractal geometry has given us a much larger vocabulary. And with larger vocabulary, we can read more of the Book of Nature. Dimension what we would think of as normal geometry. One dimension is the straight line. Two dimensions is, say, the box that has surface area. And three dimensions is a cube. But could something have a dimension somewhere in between, say, two and three? Mandelbrot said yes. Fractals do. And the rougher they are, the higher their fractal dimension. There are all of these technical terms like fractal dimension and self-similarity, but those are the nuts and bolts of the mathematics itself. What that fractal geometry does is give us a way of looking at, in a way that's extremely precise, the world in which we live, in particular the living world.